Having a gun pointed at you can affect a person in several unusual ways. To some it is terrifying and takes years to overcome. To others it is just alarming. At the age of 18, unfortunately, I had such an experience. While in the desert, while in the southern Nevada desert, a man came up to my pickup truck and put a pistol in my face. He told me to leave the area and said, quote, he had killed before and he would do it again, unquote. Not knowing what provoked him, those that were with me and I calmly got into my truck and drove away. We were approximately 30 miles south of Mesquite, Nevada at the north tip of Lake Mead on the Bundy Range. After contemplating the event, I concluded that the man had claimed his camp nearby and simply did not want us around. Although it did not cause me to fear much, it was alarming to experience how willing he was to use a gun in an effort to get us to leave. A few days later, I heard how the sheriff's department was searching for a man hiding in the desert and considered him dangerous. Being certain it was the same man who pointed his gun at me, I gave the information to a deputy, and I believe they arrested him, but I never heard any more about him again. Before this incident, in all the time my family has run cattle in the desert, for five generations, since 1877, 140 years, I have never heard of a person on our range using a gun to force or intimidate another. And then the Bureau of Land Management came to town in early 2014. Just like the man in the desert, BLM agents put guns in innocent people's faces and threatened to kill simply because the Bureau of Land Management personnel did not want us, want us there. It is, hard to, it is hard to describe the overwhelming force used by the Bureau of Land Management upon our community and family. The best way for me to describe it is like a scene out of the Hollywood movie Red Dawn. Helicopters, over 200 agents, full battle gear, loudspeakers, checkpoints, attack dogs, armed convoys, surveillance aircraft with night vision and infrared capabilities, MRAMs, assault after assault, snipers on the hill, missions, and misinformation campaigns, just to mis mention a few. In the official BLM operation plan, it, expo it, it explains in the official BLM operational plan, it ex in explanation of the campaign on the Bundy family and community, it states that, quote, this is a military type operation, unquote, and that the ICP incident command procedures, incident command procedures being used, quote, are a military model, unquote. U.S. Attorney Steve Myrie, in defense of the BLM, had to admit on court records that, quote, the BLM was a military-type force of some sort, unquote. It was reported that the Bureau of Land Management spent close to $6 million to move in and start this operation. During the 10 days they took in setting up their base of operation, a Bureau of Land Management, quote, crisis negotiator, quote, con contacted my family by phone and told us that, quote, if we resist in any way, this would be another Waco or Ruby Ridge, unquote. He further said, quote, we will kill you, unquote. The operational plans and the MOA report show that multiple sniper teams were surveillancing my family's home, quote, 24 hours a day with 360-degree surveillance, unquote, and that, quote, lethal force may be imminent, unquote. You as a reader may be asking, why such show of force? This call is from an inmate facility. You as a reader may be asking, why such so show of force? Are the Bundy such terrible people? As a Bundy myself, I will not try to defend the character of my family and I. Whether we are just a simple American ranching family or not, is for you to answer for yourself, if you so desire. However, I will say this. The overwhelming military-like force by the Bureau of Land Management upon our community and family was not over a $150 Indian bead the size of the end of my pinky. The bead used by Bureau of Land Management officials to justify sending Dan Love and over 120 BLM agents, operators, to raid homes and terrorize families 
in Blanding, Utah. Neither was the force upon my family over uh, Civil War relics, a buckle and a buckle and buttons used by the BLM to justify BLM agents in full tactical gear and assault rifles busting indoors to raid a local museum in Montana, terrorizing employees and interns that had never heard of the Bureau of Land Management before. No, the force upon my family was not over. You have one minute remaining. No, the force upon my family was not over antiques. The millions of dollars spent, hundreds of tactical agents converging, helicopters flying, armed vehicles roaming, and so on, was because my father's cattle were eating what the BLM says is their grass. Good call. It's from an inmate facility. Is their grass. A claim that the Bundy family and many others constitutionally dispute. But still the same, the excessive force upon my family used by the Bureau of Land Management was over cattle eating grass. Of course, we we could go into the details and talk about how my family have raised our cattle on this land since 1877, 140 years, before Las Vegas had even one tent in it, and 70 years before the Bureau of Land Management existed. We could talk about how over, how our water infrastructure is over 100 years old, and without it, much of the wildlife would not be able to survive parts of that desert. We could point out the constitutional violations of the Bureau of Land Management by controlling over 89% of the land in the state of Nevada, how Nevada's rural economy has been devastated by the BLM land control. We could go on about many injustices by the BLM and other federal land control agencies even show how detrimental these types of actions are to the fundamental liberties of each American. But putting all that aside, putting all the dispute out of view, and what you have left is a military-type force funded by the American taxes coming down upon American families with such terrifying force that lives are being taken. For what? Indian beads, old buckles, and cows eating grass? I know I'm not the only one that finds this ludicrous, and I'm sure that this insult to everything that is American is one of the purposes Chris has written this book. One of the ironies of this whole matter is that when Congress established the Bureau of Land Management in 1946, combining the U.S. Land Office with the U.S. Grazing Board, the directive from Congress was to dispose of the land to the people and encourage ranchers to, to graze cattle on the land. That is what Congress organized the Bureau of Land Management to do. So why the excessive force? Maybe I can best explain it this way, through a short, through a short true story. When I was around 9 or 10 years old, my family visited Lehman Cave in central Nevada. After going, after going through the magnificent underground chambers, my brothers and I were intrigued by the little birds that built their nest with mud under the canopy of the visiting center. I climbed the railing to get a peek into the mud nest when a park ranger came up and stiffly reprimanded me for disturbing the birds. He said, quote, how would you like it if I came and frightened you in your home, unquote. My intention was not to harm or frighten the birds in their homes. I was just curious. Embarrassed, I quickly jumped down as the park ranger continued to rail on us about the, the intrusion of the birds' habitat and how the birds have a right to be secure in their homes and how getting too close to them will cause them to feel danger and now they may move to another location. In shame, we took the reprimand. Then the ranger turned on his heel. This call is from an inmate facility. Then the ranger turned on his heels and with a straight back, head up, walked away. My point in telling you this story is not in the irony of the ranger's question, quote, how would you like it if I came and frightened you in your home, unquote. The point I would like to make by this story is that the park ranger was a stiffly man in, a un in uniform with a goofy hat that knew a lot about birds. He did not wear a gun. He did not have a radio. He was not wearing a protective vest or armored plates or helmet. He did not wear a star on him. His vehicle did not have red and blue lights on it. 
He did not threaten to arrest or use force upon us in any way. In fact, I do not think the use of force was anywhere in his nature. He was someone who loved the birds and looked after them. He did his job, stopped our intrusion, and educated us with a little shame, and then walked away. It was many years later that I became aware that at the time, if, that, if this park ranger did want me arrested, he would have had to call the county sheriff. He held no policing or arresting power. In fact, at the time, the park ranger not only had no policing and arresting power, he would have had no jail to take me to. And if I was put in the county or state system, the judge would have had the case thrown out because no state or county law was violated. You see, that stiff park ranger in his goofy hat held very little power, just as the Constitution intended. Unless I broke a local law voted by the representatives of the local people and enforced by the local sheriff who was elected and received policing and arresting powers from the local people, I was protected. As extreme environmentalists and social, socialist groups began to take over federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, the constitutional checks and balances were very frustrating to them. They had connived a way to create color of law without legislation by registering their policies in the federal registry, making them appear as law. But what good was their so-called law if the sheriff would not enforce them and they had no enforcing powers themselves? or jails to punish people in. These extreme environmentalists knew that the local people in general would never pass their radical environmental policies as local law. So they began to devise another means to force their ideology upon the American people. They simply would create their own law enforcement structure. Like the picture of an ape evolving into a man, peaceful park rangers in goofy hats over 35 years have evolved into terrifying soldiers with training to equal their gear. Federal law enforcement training centers were established where all the training and gear is available to any agency that wants a force. Federal jails were built and administrative judges were hired. Local checks and balances were broken down through federal funding and MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding. Local law enforcement departments were given federal funding to purchase needed equipment as long as they would accept federal agents, such as park rangers, as authorized law enforcement with policing and arresting powers. The constitutional protection afforded the people through voting and delegating their policing and arresting power was deceptively bypassed. Now all federal agents, now all a federal agent has to do to obtain supposed policing and arresting power is go to the Federal Training Center and get certified. The solemn and sacred power to take life, liberty, or property through law once came from the local people by delegation through elections and, and through elections and deputizations, now has been usurped by federal agents through certifications. The once constitutional, frustrated, extreme environmental the once constitutionally frustrated extreme environmental bureaucrat with no mechanism to enforce their own policies, now over 35 years, have developed a system to create